Hi. In this video, we'll be talking about internet addresses. So, as we've seen, the core functionality of the internet is to send information from one computer to another. So, let's say this computer is over at this end of the network, this computer is over at this end of the network. We can encode that data as digital information and send it from point A to point B. But the question is, how do these two computers find each other? How does computer A know where it should be sending these bits? Well, the answer is addressing. It turns out it's very similar to the physical postal service that we have. If any home or building wants to receive postal mail, then that building needs to have a physical street address that the mailing system can understand and locate. This is exactly the same with the internet. If any device wants to have its own internet connection, that device needs to have its own internet address. So it's important to note that these addresses aren't just random collections of characters and numbers. These addresses have a particular format that allows them to be read and understood by the mailing system. So let's look at a postal address. Different parts of this postal address narrow in more and more specifically where the location is. So first off, we see that it's in USA. So this address must be somewhere within this part of the world. We've narrowed it down to at least one country. Now we can go one line up and see that it's actually at this zip code inside San Francisco, California. So let's zoom in there. So now we see a zip code within San Francisco. Next, we can look at the street to say, oh, it's on Mission Street. It's somewhere along this particular road within that zip code. And lastly, to nail down the actual location along that street, we look at the street address. And we see that that's actually the location that we're looking for. Now, internet addresses are very similar. Every device on the internet has its own unique internet address, just like every home or building has its own unique mailing address. When we are sending data across the internet, that data sent has a to address as well as a from address. Just like when you write a letter, you need to write down the address that you're sending it to, and you need to write down the address that it's from so that the person who receives it knows who, re knows who to respond to. And lastly, the addresses follow a standard agreed upon format. If everyone agrees to write out these addresses in a particular way, then everyone will be able to read them and understand what location it's actually referring to. Now the question is, what exactly is this format for the internet? We've seen the format for a physical mailing address, but what, is, what does the format look like for an internet address? Well, that is decided by what is called the Internet Protocol, or IP. So the Internet Protocol is a protocol that defines the layout of an internet address, also known as an IP address. So here's an example IP address, and it's pretty much just four numbers. But these four numbers carry a very specific meaning. So this address is actually hierarchical. It's set up as a hierarchy. To see what I mean, let's lay out each of these numbers. So the first number actually specifies the network that it belongs to on the internet. And this is a very broad, massive network, kind of like a country. The next number specifies the subnetwork within that massive network. So this might be narrowing it down to a region within that network. Then the next number is a subnetwork within that subnetwork. It is a sub subnetwork. So we're giving, getting even more specific. We're seeing the actual small network that this device resides in. And the last number specifies the actual location of the device within that subnetwork. So if we use this image to represent the entire internet, we see that it'd be very hard to find any particular location if each of these circles was just randomly assigned a number. We would have to iterate over every single one. We'd have to search every single circle until we found the one we were looking for. This is why we need this hierarchical layout. So with the given example, the first number is going to specify the network. So this could be the 93 network within the internet. And then the next number is the subnetwork within that. So those other branches would have some other value. This is the 184 branch. Within the 184 branch, we need the 216 branch. So maybe that specifies this tiny little subnetwork. And now within there, all we have to do is look at the 34 and say, oh, that's the 34 device in that tiny subnetwork. So it's very easy to go from the very broad, massive internet and narrow in piece by piece to the actual device we're looking for. Just like in the postal address, we're narrowing it down by country, state, zip code, street, and street address. Setting up IP addresses in this hierarchical way also allows the system to be very scalable. It's very easy to add more networks and add more devices to the internet using this hierarchical layout. If we're adding a new device to a subnetwork, all we have to do is generate a unique number for the last number in the IP address. And if we're adding a brand new network to the internet, we just have to generate a new first number for the address. Another important thing to note about IP addresses is that each one of these numbers is represented using eight bits which means that the entire IP address is easily expressible as a single binary number that has 32 bits. So no matter the IP address, 
guaranteed it is a 32-bit address, eight bits or one byte per number. And that also means that we have two to the eight or 256 possible numbers for each place in the IP address. Each number can take on any value between zero and 255. So since we have 32 bits to work with, this means we have two to the 32 or over four billion possible IP addresses. 0, 0.0.0.0, 0. 0. all the way up to 255, 255, 255, 255. Now you would think that over 4 billion possible IP addresses would be enough to cover every single device that would ever connect to the internet. But it turns out the internet got way more popular than anyone expected. So it turns out this, this system of IP addressing is actually a little outdated. So this 32-bit version of the protocol is actually called IPv4. And IPv4 has been around since the 80s. Back in the 80s, 4 billion seemed like it would be enough. Turns out it's not. We will have well over 4 billion devices on the internet very soon. So what's the solution to this? How are we going to handle all of these new devices that are gonna be on the internet very soon? Well, introducing IPv6. So IPv6 is a new 128-bit version of the internet protocol. So we are currently in the middle of transitioning all of our IP addresses from IPv4 to IPv6. And in IPv6, each device actually has an address that's made up of 128 bits. That means we have two to the 128 or that many possible addresses. That should absolutely be enough for the foreseeable future. So this is what an IPv6 address looks like. Rather than having four numbers that are represented using eight bits, we actually have eight hexadecimal numbers that are made up of four hexadecimal digits. Since each hex value can be expressed using four bits, that's eight numbers times four digits times four bits per digit, which is 128 bits. So IPv6 has the same hierarchical structure that IPv4 has, just this time it has way more possible combinations. Now you may be wondering, who's deciding all these protocols? Who gets to say that we're making the transition from IPv4 to IPv6, and who gets to design IPv6? Well, it turns out it's actually a group of people that decide on these protocols, and that group is known as the Internet Engineering Task Force, or the IETF. Now, what's really cool about the IETF is it's all volunteers. It is an open community of engineers, designers, vendors, and researchers who are all mutually concerned with the evolution and smooth functioning of the internet. As the internet grows and gains more users, gains more functionality, we need the entire system to operate smoothly, and we need the systems that it's built upon to accept this oncoming traffic. And what's incredible is that the people who have stepped up to take on this task are all volunteering. It's not a single company or a single person that's making these decisions. It is a collaborative group of people working together to decide what's best. They mostly coordinate through mailing lists and they meet about three times a year. And it's open to anyone. So if you're interested in seeing how these protocols are decided, or maybe even designing the future protocols of the internet, check out the Internet Engineering Task Force. They're open to everyone.